But I think in the long run, in the next 10, 20 years, we'll have bond deals of over 20%. In <laughs> Yes, I like it that you laugh. I like that. I, I am not. I am not laughing from humor, and I'm not laughing because I think you're silly. I think you're actually brilliant, and I would agree you with. Don't you. say that. If <laughs> we are all brilliant, <laughs> I would. Everybody agree thinks with you, it's brilliant, but I'm actually going to agree with you on that. But I laugh because if you think about that. That is so out of the realm. Hey guys, I am with Dr. Mark Faber, editor of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. I should say editor and publisher. He's also a renowned investor for those that you don't know, historian and a mentor of mine from very far. So, Mark, how are you? I hope that was enough flattery for you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Too much. <laughs> it's not healthy. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I'm fine. Uh, the economy here in Thailand is not doing well. But I think there are signs that it's sort of bottoming. Having said that, uh, people who are not familiar with the conditions We've been in Asia in most markets, like in a 10 years bear market relative to the S and P 500 and the markets are not dirt cheap in general, but they're relatively good value certainly compared to high price stocks in the U S and in Europe and uh, the economies of Asia are relatively resilient. I mean, it's not going to be a bull many times soon in the Asian region, but when the things go bad, people tighten their belts and then there is a natural pickup after a certain time during which debts were repaid or uh, not paid. But in general, the, my belief is that the Asian economies do not have the burden of uh, huge debts that we have in the Western world. I can see that on the individual level, uh, in some countries, the debt level is high. I mean, poor people, they're out in debts up to here and they're not going to be a factor in the economic recovery. But other companies and uh, wealthy people, they're relatively liquid. And they can drive some sort of a recovery as well as, you know, I look at the price level, say, of Thailand compared to the U.S. For an American, it pays to go travel to Thailand and stay in Thailand for a month because the price level is so much lower than in the U.S. And I see a lot of Western people, they come here on a holiday because we don't have a democracy, but we have a lot of freedom. Everything goes, you know, people are tolerant to each other. There, there's no crime to speak of. There, are, there is a wave of criminality that comes about from time to time, but nothing compared to the U S or to Europe, you know, you can walk around in the streets anywhere in Asia, the Philippines is a bit more dangerous, but anywhere in Asia and nobody will give you a hard time. Nobody. Interesting. The safest place, of course, Singapore, but Singapore is expensive. Hong Kong is very safe and uh, because of the good Chinese government. <laughs> and, and Thailand, I mean, I have a house. Maybe I shouldn't say this on TV, but I, I don't have a key to my office. I keep it open 24 hours a day. I have some dogs. I have some dogs and three crocodiles in the garden. <laughs> that really leads me to, I'm um, glad we jumped into Asia, is you are starting two things. One's a thought. I don't think I've ever recalled this much negativity specifically with China um, in the U.S. media, if you would. And I find that interesting, and perhaps that's also a reason for the sell-off. But 
Asia in general, are you, and you said Thailand specifically, are you seeing a lot of value in assets that you would be attractive to you now? Well, the first uh, comment that you made about the media, I mean, I find it incredible how the Western media and Westerners, because of the influence of the media on them, have turned to horrible China bashers. The ordinary Chinese man, worker, ch child, student, and so forth, he has nothing at all against Western people, nothing at all. China is not a belligerent society, but of course, they will defend themselves. It's not going to be again like the 19th century when the British extorted money from China following the first opium war in 1842. And, uh, Grab the piece of land of China, Hong Kong belongs to China. <laughs> There's no question about it. Just took it as a penalty. That is never hap going to happen again in Chinese history. The Chinese will fight to the end. That I guarantee every Westerners, and I think the American State Department would uh, do well if they remembered this comment. The Chinese are today in a position where they can defend themselves and inflict considerable damage on any aggression from overseas. Considerable damage. I mean, if someone attacks China or what they perceive to be Chinese territory, including Taiwan and Hong Kong and so forth, I guarantee you the missiles will land this time around in the United States. There's no question about this. They have the technology. And whereas, you know, if you ask me about China, uh, it is true that in mannerism, they sometimes are not the most diplomatic people. But you have to see, people always complain. They say, China built railroads in Laos and Cambodia. Well, what did the Americans do? <laughs> they carpet bombed the countries. So what do you prefer? Someone to build the railroads for you? Of course they are corrupt. But we Westerners are also corrupt. There's no difference. There's no difference at all. Maybe the size of Western, maybe it's more expensive to bribe a Westerner than to bribe a Cambodian and Laotian. Yeah. Well, I mean, I analyzed the budget in America carefully. It's roughly $4 trillion that they spend every year. Mm -hmm. Say in the most honest society, uh, the corruption would be about 5% of the budget. In a corrupt society, say you take African nations, it's about 80%. And so the budget is at $4 trillion, 80% goes into the pockets. In America, say, I'd say 10% goes into the pockets, but on 4 trillion, it's $400 billion that gets stolen. The point is, in the last four or five years following COVID, the U.S. has had an economic growth rate because what they did is they just distribute money and create a budget deficit. So the government issues essentially money. They print money to pay for the deficit and the deficit is distributed to industries and to all sorts of people. So you keep the people consuming. That is what America has done in China. They didn't do that, but they made major advances in technology, major. That is why the Chinese bashing is about all the time. They bashed the Chinese because for the first time, Western nations realized, they don't say it, but they realize that in many industries, China is much advanced compared to Western countries. Huge advances, huge, not small, huge. Plus, whatever 
is manufactured in Germany or in America, you can manufacture in China 50% cheaper. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So that leads... And they hate China because China, they don't care so much about Europe and the U.S. because their main exports, more than 50% of the exports, go into other emerging economies. Right. They don't go to America. Before, when I grew up, and then I went to Hong Kong in 73, throughout the 70s and 80s, the saying was, when the U.S. sneezes, Hong Kong catches a cold because all the exports, not all, but say 90% went to the U.S. and to Europe. Now, it's no longer the case. That is what gets the American media, that China is no longer dependent on the U.S. And that's why they hate them. It's normal. If you are, go out to a nightclub and your friend pinches your girlfriend away, you're not going to love him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the guy. <laughs> you want to kill him. <laughs> so, it, it, it is a jealousy element involved in this. You understand? The, the Americans, especially the, the people in the State Department, the neocons, they hate any country that threatens the U.S. They manage now very well to destroy Germany. They would love to do it with China the same. Well, I guess then you said, made a comment that you think that Ed. specifically Thailand, but, and I'm going to assume that you mean most of Asia is bottoming here. Um, you're starting to see some fair to good value. Is that correct? And then the Asian markets then? Well, I mean, in some markets, this unbelievable value depends, uh, of course, a lot on the world situation and on structural adjustments. I mean, I can see, and I, I wrote about this years ago already. If you have a major city and uh, conditions change, the major city may lose its importance. You know, you, you take Manchester. Manchester was one of the richest cities around 1830, 1840. It, and it was a dominant city in manufacturing. Listen. Venice was a dominant city in the 15th and 16th century, less so in the 16th, but certainly in the 14th and 15th century, and so forth and so on. There are cities like Babylon and Nineveh, they vanished. <laughs> they vanished. They were capital of empires. What is Athens? It was the cultural center, was a very important city. Rome is still important because there is, the Pope sits there, but politically it has no, no influence globally. What do the Chinese care about Rome? They go there as a tourist. You see the Coliseum, now things can go wrong. Anyway, I think the big question is not just for Hong Kong and other Asian cities, but also for the US and Europe. Is it possible that there is a major change in how people work? Because you and I, I don't sit in a big city, in a financial center. 30 years ago, I would not have been able to sit in the north of Thailand and conduct this interview with you. No way. And at that time, Bloomberg travel didn't exist. Now I have it on my computer. It's very expensive. But it's worth my time because I can have Bloomberg here. And when I go to Switzerland or travel around the world, I can use Bloomberg. So I'm like a nomad. And uh, I don't need to go to an office. I have an office in Hong Kong. But why do I have an office? Mostly because of regulation. You know, the, re the regulatory environment asks you to have an office somewhere. But this will, this will also change over time. Now, the question is, at the moment, in America, the property prices have dropped. 
sometimes 80%. And in Hong Kong, the property stocks, we're talking about value. The property stocks are selling at approximately 80% discount to the asset value. Everybody knows that the asset value is too high and has to be written off, but I doubt it will have to be written off by more than 80%. That I doubt. So there is value. In Thailand, we have some companies there, say, solid, and they are at the lowest level in, say, 10 years or so. Same in Indonesia. The only market in Asia which is expensive is India. And I have a friend, he is a, he's working for the Elliott Wave. Okay, everybody thinks they're always bearish, but actually he is very bullish about Asian stocks from a technical point of view. His name is Mark Galaweski, the nice person and very knowledgeable. And according to his chart work, there's a major breakout occurring now in Singapore, Malaysia, and other Asian countries. Markets having bottomed out already last October and being in an uptrend. I mean, my portfolio is in Asia, and I'm not saying this because I'm a, well, consider myself to be a genius, but I'm consider myself to be an average investor. My portfolio is in Asia. Despite the fact that all this negativity has come out, last week hit the new high in value. Well, in dollar terms, even my Thai portfolio, the Thai market hasn't done well. We have high dividends and uh, some stocks have actually rebounded quite a lot. The Malaysian stock market is up 20% this year. Especially last month, they had a big move. Let's talk about Japan. We had, uh, I had a few guests on, Michael uh, Gaia, I don't know if you know who he is. He's wrote extens extensively about the end of the end carry trade. And then I had Simon Hunt, who you might know, he's out of Dubai. He calls that the... Uh, Both was, are friends of mine. Both of them are friends of yours. <laughs> That's great. Um, I had Simon Hunt on and he's talked about the end of the yen carry trade as well. What is your opinion on that? Where are we at with that? And is all that money going to come home back to Japan? That's a very good question and nobody knows the answer. I mean, in theory, as of today, yeah, I can check for you. The 10 years bond in the U.S. would be at precisely... Now in the U.S., we are at 3.78% um, yield. In Japan, we are at 0 0.87 yield, okay? In other words, in the U.S., you earn 3% more. Would you now put all your money into yen? I think the yen will appreciate, you understand? I think the dollar is grossly overvalued. The bank credit analyst published recently an excellent chart that showed the wages in Japan compared to wages in the U.S. They rose sharply until about 10 years ago, and now Japanese wages are at uh, relative to U.S. wages, again, at the lowest point ever. Very low. So I guess your position is on the end of the end carry trade that it might not be ending then, or you just don't really know or have an opinion. I mean, I wouldn't uh, short the yen to buy any asset. The yen is fundamentally undervalued. I think fundamentally, the euro is relatively low, although Europe is a mess, politically seen. And, uh, but, but I can see that the price level in many countries, also Latin America, is so much lower than in the U.S. that it, it, the U.S., in my opinion, in the next administration, especially under Trump, will carry out 
a major devaluation of the US dollar, major. It may not be so visible with other paper currencies because all paper currencies are a disaster in the long run. This historically is clear, but we had already this year, the beginning of a devaluation of paper money against gold and silver. Less so against platinum, it will occur. We also had the loss of pay purchasing power of the dollar and other currencies against cryptocurrencies. I'm not a wildly optimistic about the outcome of cryptos, but I'm just saying, I think governments in the Western world will have to inflate their problems away. So that's what we're going into right now. I'm afraid, yes, that is about what do we, what Mr. Powell has just announced. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel sorry for him because intellectually he's not brilliant. Alan Greenspan <laughs> was an intelligent <laughs> man, but Powell is just kind of a third third class bureaucrat that is way over his head in his position. Got it. If you analyze the deficit in the United States, okay, is either of the two candidates, Mr. Trump or the genius called Harris, going to do anything about the deficits? You have to believe in Father Christmas to think that they will do anything about the deficits. Nothing. It will increase under them. And uh, then comes the unfunded liabilities. Now, the unfunded liabilities are, to a large extent, not only, but to a large extent, an asset problem. In other words, the asset value to solve the unfunded liabilities, the assets should go up a lot. So can they afford to let the stock market go down? Can they afford to let the residential property market drop 50%? You know what a 50% drop in residential properties would do to the economy? <laughs> but people say it's not going to happen. That's what commercial real estate people all said until just recently. Suddenly, these commercial properties have dropped in some cases, 70, 80% in value. I mean, it's unbelievable. Right. What I have, look, I tell you, the whole economy is nowadays dependent on inflated assets. I wouldn't want to be in an econo economic system or in a society where the prosperity depends on inflated asset prices because whatever is inflated for sure will come down one day for sure the question is will it come down tomorrow or in five years but we talked about or you mentioned it that the central bank can keep the asset prices high by printing money that is correct in nominal terms that i have to spell out because it is conceivable that say your wages go up 10% per annum, but the cost of living goes up by 15% per annum. So in real terms, your wealth goes down. That's this been analyzed by, among others, Irving Fisher, the illusion of money. Is it? Yeah. What does this, I guess, in your opinion, mean for the rest of the commodities? Because they've actually had pretty much a flat, just tough year, if you would. Are you <laughs> bullish on uh, on other commodities? Do it. Yes, this is. I mean, a very good question, because uh, let me phrase it this way: the commodities and assets they have a headwind and a tailwind. The headwind is. Diminished demand. I believe the world is already in recession. It all depends how you define it. But say 
if you look at the economic statistics of the globe, global economy, we haven't reached the peak prosperity of 2018, 2019 yet. So we fell in 2020 and we recovered, but we're not above the 2018 level. Some government statistics will tell you that we're above it, but in real terms, inflation adjusted, we are below. Anyway, now the headwind for commodities is global demand that simply is not as strong as when we came out of the recession in 2009, 2010, when the demand was driven by strong growth in China. Chinese growth is not going to happen anytime soon. The economy may not collapse, but strong growth is unlikely to happen. Now, the tailwind is money printing. So you have these two conflicting forces. The, the Fed and other central banks, they actually keep interest rates artificially low. In my book, even at this level of interest rates, they're still below the rate of inflation. The government statistics will show differently, but the government statistics are published by people who are born and are pathological liars. So I wouldn't necessarily trust the statistics that are published by governments, but private economies that are independent from Wall Street, Wall Street will always look at the government statistics as if they are written in stone. Because the financial sector, Wall Street, is interested that asset prices go up. They're interested in money printing because as asset prices go up, their fees go up. <laughs> so right. You will never find an economist on Wall Street that will openly criticize the Fed. Yeah. You know, but you bring the that. reality is simply... Look at what Don, Dollar General, the retailer, or Dollar Tree are publishing in their reports. They cater to lower middle class and to poor people because the prices are very low. They will tell you exactly how spending is for the majority of Americans. Yeah. For the majority. Yeah. You're rich. And, uh, you know, financial robber barons like myself, we like this inflation because it lifts asset prices. And compared to, say, three years ago, when I didn't get any interest on my deposits, now I will 5% or so on my deposits. Right. You know, um, it's interesting you mentioned that about economists on Wall Street. The last time we talked to you, told me to have John Williams of Shadow Stats on. And I did. Correct. I did. I had him on. And I told him I had him on by your recommendation. <laughs> and he was very, happy very about kind it. of you. <laughs> I talked to him and it was a great interview. I'll put it at the end of this interview. I'll link to it. And he talked to you and he made a very compelling case about whatever is being printed as the inflation rate. And I want to paraphrase this and I'll email you that interview as well. He said, tack on about 8% to that number. So our inflation rate, and this is probably still low, but according to John Williams, we're about 11%. If you have a 3% printed inflation rate currently, and then you add on another eight, you're going to get 11%, which how is that sustainable if that is true? Yeah, well, first of all, inflation goes up or it goes down. It will never stay at the same level. Right. And asset prices as they are as of today, they need the money printing. Otherwise the system collapses. Yep. So the outcome is not going to be good. Now about the statistics of John, I have a great admiration for the man. I mean, he's a man that is a, he's, he's a scientist. He's an academic. He understand he doesn't have an agenda to be the, doing something for the left or for the right. He's interested in compiling statistics as he feels is the right way. Now, that the right way is a very big 
question mark in life. You understand what is the truth <laughs> and right way. And the in and about the inflation, I just want to say this. Inflation is basically an increase in the quantity of money and debt. The symptoms are rising stock prices or rising commodity prices, rising gold prices, rising collectibles, the rising diamonds, rising properties, rising whatever not. Now, some of the symptoms are an increase in the cost of living, food, services. You go to Disney Park and so forth and so forth. But each household has a different rate of inflation. Say, if I'm single and I'm not married and I have no children, my rate of inflation is very different from the one who is married, has four children, uh, and uh, the children go to school and so forth and so on. That would be and, me. Uh, <laughs> and they eat, uh, they eat, of course, a lot, the children. You know, if you have four children, you need a, a huge expense on food. In the bachelor, he has a huge expense on drinking and drugs. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And on keeping women away. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I have, a, I have a friend who lives in Australia and uh, he's an American and he does a lot of business in Asia, but we will talk online or over Skype or whatever. And he throws out all statistics when it comes to inflation, just because not all statistics, but he's very suspicious of anything public or printed just because it's so impossible to calculate. And it means so many different things for, as you said, so many different people. So it's interesting. We had in Hong Kong after the war, uh, secretary, the financial secretary, they, they had that time in 1950, a different name. And uh, his name for right now slips in my mind. But he resisted that the government collects statistics because he said the government officials will then abuse the statistics and use it for all sorts of programs. So it's better not to publish them in the first place. <laughs> He's very and under him, the economy grew very fast, around 10% per annum. And so in the 19, uh, late 60s, they asked, they asked him in an interview, how is it possible that your economy grew by that much per annum? He said, for 20 years since I'm in this position, I've tried to keep government officials away from interfering in the economy. It was a largely laissez-faire economy, Hong Kong. Very, very little regulation. Yeah. When I started to work in Hong Kong in 1973, that was, I think, the first year where they introduced something similar to an SEC. <laughs> and I remember the first chairman, he was sort of a friend of mine from one of the top families of Hong Kong, linked to the Bank of East Asia, top family reputation-wise. He had no clue at all about the financial market. It was just, <laughs> he was alone. And then he, when we traveled sometimes together on, uh, on airplanes, he was talking nonsense about anything. You know, <laughs> that was the so-called beginning of the SEC in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, it's called SFC. It's a great story. The Curious and Futures Commission, something like this. A, a painful organization protecting the wealthy people, not the individual investor. It's like all bureaucrats. Um, yes. Yeah. So we anyway, but what I want to say, I think, and this is what I wrote recently, I think we are turning points in asset markets because the Fed, they can support asset prices, okay? What they cannot support is basically asset prices and the dollar at the same time. So you support asset prices, you print money, 
or you, it may not show up, but there's plenty of liquidity in the system at the present time. Otherwise you, we wouldn't have the kind of volatility we have. And then the dollar goes down or the rate of inflation exceeds the asset gains. I give you an example, 1966, the Dow in America, Dow Jones almost hit a thousand. In 19, that was 64. In 66, it hit a thousand. And then in 73, it exceeded a thousand. And in 1982, it was at, for a brief period of time in uh, August 82, the Dow was below 800. So 64 to 80, uh, 82, we were sidelined in prices, more or less. But inflation adjusted, we dropped 70%. Yeah. And also the dollar went down. So it is possible that asset prices would stay nominally at the high price, but fall in real terms. Like wages at the present time for most people is, are declining. Yeah. And your friend who doesn't trust the statistics is absolutely right. And John Williams' statistics about inflation are closer to the truth than what the government is publishing. Now, I personally think that my rate of inflation is not at the present time 11% per annum, but I don't live in the US, I live here in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And in Thailand, as I said, everybody has a different rate of inflation. In Thailand, the price of my cigarettes haven't gone up for now three or four years. And the price of my beer has diminished a little bit because I can buy it cheaper now. <laughs> awesome. The rest, the rice price doesn't interest me much because I don't eat a lot of rice. But beer and cigarettes, that is the major expenditures for my food. <laughs> well, um, if you would, and this is, we're going to project really, and we'll end on this. Give me one thought that would be helpful to the viewers from now to be aware of from now until the end of the year. And again, we're coming up on Fed lowering or potentially lowering, but very much so an important election and so on. What would be that one thought you would give to people? I mean, look, I live through the inflation of the 60s and 70s. By 1980, if there was one thought in the investment community that was really widespread, the so-called consensus, it was that inflation would stay high, would accelerate, that bonds were certificates of confiscation, and Robert Prechter, he published his first book in 78, and he predicted the Dow to go at the time I don't know, 3,000. People thought he's crazy. Never going to happen. Yes. And now, since August 82, in the case of stocks, and uh, in the case of bonds in September 1981, we've been in bull markets. And in the case of bonds, they kept, the bull market came to an end. It wasn't artificially low. It came to an end in August 2020. Since then, interest rates have started to go up. Now, it is possible that they go down. We're down on the 10 years from over 5% to less than 4%, as I've just said before. But I think in the long run, in the next 10, 20 years, we'll have bond yields of over 20%. Oh, in Yes, I'm, I like it that you laugh. I like that. I, I am not. I am not laughing from humor, and I'm not laughing because I think you're silly. I think you're actually brilliant, and I would agree yeah, with. Don't you. say that. If <laughs> we're all brilliant, <laughs> I would. Agree Everybody with thinks you, it's brilliant, but I'm actually going to agree with you on that. But I laugh because if you think about that. That is so out of the realm. Yes, but the, but the, 
what I meant to say is people, they believe asset prices will go up. They buy stocks. They say, well, we may have a bear market, 30, 40%, but then they right. go up again. But how about if stocks peak out and then for 20, 30 years don't recover? You look at Cisco, it was the number one company in year 2000. Everybody said Cisco and Cisco here and Cisco there. Never recovered to the previous peak. Ditto yep. for Intel. Yeah, same thing. I grew up with the, you know, when I started to work in 1970 in New York, the favorite stocks were Sears, J.C. Penney, Polaroid, IBM, Polaroid, Kodak, Xerox, the three unique technologies. We had analysts at Whitewell. They said, Kodak and Polaroid, they will sell this many pictures in China because the Chinese will start to take pictures when they grow richer and so forth. They were wrong in the sense that the Chinese took many more pictures than ever anyone could have <laughs> imagined, except they didn't use the films of Kodak and Polaroid anymore because everything is digital. Yeah. That's no analyst would have predicted that the world takes so many pictures. Why? Because people are in love with themselves. They take pictures of themselves the whole day. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's the greatest invention, the selfie picture. <laughs> well, uh, on that, uh, Dr. Mark Faber, uh, well, and I just want to thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, people want, as I am, a fan of your work. How can they find you? Well, I'm not sure they should, but. I have a website called uh, gloomboomdoom.com, all in one word. Gloom, boom, doom, one word. What if they Google my name, Mark Faber, they also get somewhere redirected to something. I will put a link. To I that. don't have a blog. I must point this out because people always say you wrote on your blog. No, I don't. But the people that do the blogs, and there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> No, well, and let me tell you a story. I had a friend in 2007. He subscribed to your newsletter, Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. And um, we were we were talking, and this was in 2009. And I go, hey, how do you like the report? How are you liking Mark and his analysis? And he goes, he called the bottom, because I remember he called the bottom. And he goes, Andy, he not only called the bottom, he called the top. <laughs> so I'm I'm assuming he's still a uh, subscriber to this. Well, you, you know, nobody can predict the future. That I'm fully aware of. But I, I think <laughs> well, sometimes <laughs> uh, a clock that stands still is twice a day right. <laughs> right. So well, I want to wish okay, you all anyway, the best. Very nice to talk to you. I and need I'll see to do some work. Yep. And I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for your yes. time, Faber. Take care. Bye-bye.